The use of the word welfare as a pejorative term has been used to dissociate one particular group from the rest of us, to try and conceptualise the idea that there is an underclass who don't pull their weight, who don't try hard enough, who are happy to be, using the quotes, dependent on welfare and, and really let the rest of us pay for them. I think that's a misunderstanding, but politically it's very effective. Politically, it allows people to suggest that all the money is disappearing on a small group of people um, who could work if they really tried. What kind of person relies on welfare in the UK? And if I'd asked this question at this time last year, would your answer have been any different? I'm talking to you from my small spare room that overlooks Brixton High Road. I've spent the majority of my time here since the pandemic began. The same pandemic that has made all of us rely on state support in ways we hadn't anticipated. And for many of us, has challenged our beliefs about who needs the welfare state and why. When I spoke to the late John Hills in 2017, it was a bright cold December afternoon. John had made his way up to the LSE's media studio, which overlooks central mm. London. Cool. As we sat just a metre apart, the engineer checked our levels. How are we, how are we doing? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, we're all good. Uh, we're recording, so whenever you're ready... John Hills dedicated his life's work to tackling inequality, defending and improving the welfare state, and understanding the effects social policies play over the course of a person's life. In this episode of LSEIQ, we're taking you back to that cold December day to revisit John's views on the state of the welfare state. So let's start at the beginning. What is the welfare state? For me, it encompasses the range of what we do collectively through paying taxes and through the state providing services and money across the range of pensions, support for people who are unemployed or for other reasons can't work, healthcare, which in Britain is done through the National Health Service, state education, other kinds of public services. And so in many ways, going back to beverages, vision 75 years ago and, and his report, it's the things that we do collectively to combat those five giants of want, idleness, ignorance, squalor, and... Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> I always forget them too. <laughs> want, disease... The reason why we're trying to recount Beveridge's giants here is because our interview was in advance of 2018's LSE Festival, dedicated to William Beveridge. In 1942, Beveridge launched his blueprint for a universal care system that sought to combat five giants on the road to post-war reconstruction. This is the universal care system that is still at the heart of our welfare state today. So let's try again. It's the things that we do collectively through the state to combat those giants that Beveridge identified of disease, squalor, idleness, want, ignorance. The great triumph of Beveridge in 1942 and then the post-war Labour government in, in Britain from 1945 was to put together um, all of the different risks that we face um, as individuals going through our lives and as families, um, the need to support people when they're going through education but also to need to support them when they're, when they're out of work because of old age or illness. Um, or, or the, the, the extra needs we have when we have children or support for us when, we, when, when we're sick. Those were all put, all those different risks which, which affect everybody were put together in one place. As these are different ways in which we as a society can organise ourselves efficiently, because often it's much more efficient to do this through the state, to, to cope with those where you might not yourself face the risk of unemployment but you will, one hopes, um, have um, live long enough to go into retirement, but not knowing how long that retirement's going to take. That's a risk. We cover that through a pension system um, organised um, through, through the state. So that initial conception of the welfare state as a whole, which I think still describes exactly what we do, was a, an inclusive one, um, an in encompassing one. Um, so that brought along people um, who might in some quarters be seen as somehow undeserving um, but might by others seen as unlucky, along with all of the life risks that everybody else faces. 
It's different from some modern conceptions of really the US idea of welfare, meaning only handouts to people of working age with deep public suspicion as to whether those people really need them, whether they're pulling their weight. So the word welfare has moved from being an, uh, a, an encompassing term, an inclusive term, which, um, which, which covered us all, and which I still believe is actually what the state is doing through at least two thirds of, of public spending, to often being used in a pejorative sense um, as something stigmatized and undesirable um, through this, this use of the word welfare and using the word the welfare budget, for instance, rather than referring to the social security system, which is what we'd formerly got, got used to. Okay, so that's what the welfare state is and why welfare became a dirty word. But what does the UK's welfare state actually do? The welfare state does two things at the same time. So let's take the broad conception of the welfare state and think how it's funded. Um, we pay for the welfare state through, um, through taxes. And by and large, if you look at the British tax system, at least by the time you add up the indirect taxes like VAT or council tax or taxes on tobacco and, and alcohol, you add those together with the direct taxes, income tax, national insurance contributions, those by and large take exactly the same share of income of people, whether they're rich or poor. So we all pay in basically a share of our income when we've got it. That tends to be at its greatest when we're of working age, because that's when our, our incomes are the highest. On the spending side, what comes out is um, everything we spend on the National Health Service, on pensions, on education. That's the great bulk of what we, what we spend money on. Those are life cycle things. Those are life stage things that it's depending on whether you think it's the children who are getting benefits of the education and the child benefit or whether you think it's the parents, you know, that's at a particular life stage. The pensions and particularly the health care come, come when we're older. Um, so roughly two thirds, uh, maybe even three quarters of what the welfare state as a whole does is about those, that life cycle, about those life cycle needs. A lot of the debate around the welfare state concerns who pays in and who takes out. But a better way of looking at it is not who benefits, but when we benefit. When we're working, that's the point where we're paying the most taxes. We're out of pocket, if you like, compared with what we're getting back. But we're hoping that our children will pay into the system and will support our health care and our pensions. That's the bulk of what the welfare state does. The bulk of what we do comes back to ourselves. You can think of it as a sort, almost like a, a savings system that rather than having to put a lot of money aside when we're working to pay for our future health care um, or to you know, pay for all of our, our, our future pensions, we're, we've made this implicit um, generational bargain that we'll do that for our parents as long as we hope they'll, they'll do it for us. Of course, one of the main things that the welfare state is meant to do is have a kind of redistributive effect. Um, and yet many people also believe that the welfare state shouldn't be used that much to kind of address these issues of inequality. Um, why is there that paradox? The smaller part of what the welfare state does is the redistribution um, at, at a point in time to, to, towards people who are poorer at the moment, who are getting one kind of social security benefit or another. That though is, is the minority of what the system is doing. In fact, only of all the money we spend on the welfare state, only one pound in 15 goes to cash payments to working age people who are not in work. Most of the money is going to the things that I think would be generally recognised as things from which everybody benefits. And even that, if you think, oh, well, that one pound in 15, that's going to this dependent under underclass. Actually, there's a lot of turnover. People's circumstances change. And it might not be you who've lost your job today, but it might be you tomorrow, or it might be your children, um, or it might be other... John couldn't have known what 2020 had in store, but his words seem particularly poignant now. At the end of 2019, 2.7 million of us were on universal credit, and by the end of 2020, it was 5.8 million. That's a two-fold increase in just 12 months. The government is perhaps doing more in redistribution than it's used to, 
but with so many facing an uncertain future, is it doing enough? Was it even doing enough in 2017? Do you think the welfare state should do more in terms of this redistribution? I think the welfare state is being given a much tougher task and it is clearly not doing enough to produce the kind of equal society which gives everybody a fairer chance in life. One of the difficulties which countries like Britain face, which have very high levels of inequality in the income we get from the market, from our jobs, is that the state has to work really hard to try and narrow those gaps through the combination of spending and, and taxation. If there were fewer gaps in market income, if, if earnings differentials were not so wide, and if low pay was not so low, we wouldn't have to work the state wouldn't have to work so hard to narrow those gaps. Now, those gaps have increased, and that means the state has to, um, would have to do more to stand still, at the same time as it's having to do more to cope with ageing. We've gone through a very benign period where the big baby boomer generation um, um, was, uh, was of working age, and therefore a lot of people at work were supporting a smaller number of retired people. The baby boomer generation is getting nearer to retirement, and that means there are going to be fewer people around of working age to support each pension, and that, that's going to be expensive. But at the moment, we're trying to cope with that cost, not through raising taxes, but through austerity. And that austerity inevitably hits people who've currently got lower incomes harder than people who've got higher incomes. And in particular, you can see some of the things that are going on at the moment. The, after the 2015 election, the um, current government, then under David Cameron and, and George Osborne, announced £12 billion pounds of what they described as welfare, cu welfare cuts. That is, the implication was that that would be cuts in um, social security spending tax credits um, for working age people. Now, actually... That, that would, if you, if you took that literally and you took that money only out of people who are out of work, that would have been a third of spending on, on benefits for working age people who aren't, who aren't in paid work. Actually, it, the pain is being spread more, more, more widely because it's being spread into reductions in the, in the value of tax credits or of universal credit as it comes in for, the, for those in, in low-paid work. And that's being achieved through a series of measures. The, for instance, the level of uh, working age benefits is frozen in cash terms. The inflation rate is currently 3% a year. Those benefits are frozen in cash terms until at least 2020. So each, each of those 3% inflation is a reduction in 3%. That is going to make inequality worse. Um, combined with the restriction of the number of children that we, we say we'll support through the, through the system to only two, that will hit particularly larger families um, and it will cause a very large increase in child poverty. Um, so at the moment, rather than actually reducing inequality, the changes we're making to the system in the UK, the way we've designed austerity over the next four years and what's still within the system, um, will be to make it worse. And it will mean that the, the system is going to do less of its job. So we have two different crises at the same time. One is the difficulty in keeping up with rising demands on things like the National Health Service, which everybody can see the, the pressure on that. And the second is trying to meet some of the savings by taking money away from those who, were, who are already the poorest. Um, all of this being done because um, the alternative would be to increase taxes on better off people. The last financial crisis of 2008 caused heated discussions around the role of the welfare state and whether the poor simply cost everyone else too much money. But John's research points the finger in the opposite direction. There's this idea that um, the poor have got too expensive and in your book you say if, it, if anyone's got too expensive it has in fact been the rich what do you mean by that and we've all heard particularly since the crisis about the squeeze middle it's the share of the top that's gone up and that's what mean what that's what's meant there's been 
a smaller share for absolutely everybody else. Now, th you know, there was at one point an argument that said, okay, but we let the, we let the top is accelerate away and that will benefit all of us. There will be a trickle down effect, um, which will mean everybody will be better off. We don't need to worry too much whether they're getting a large share because we're all better off. And I think that argument following the crash after 2008 and the realization that a lot of what we thought was this benign um, growth, that turned out to be built on sand. And to now say that our rate of growth over the last 30 years has been much greater as a result of the increased share, the greater inequality and the increased share at the top, I think rings pretty hollow now, given that we're now into our 10th year um, with, with um, middle income living standards still below where they were, or earnings still below they were just before the crisis. This whole kind of idea of us and them seems to be really persistent, and you've mentioned we're all in this together. Um, how, what, can, what can you do, what can we all do to move this kind of general consensus of it is us and them to whether we're all in this together? Maybe one way of achieving that is to look back to what people like Beveridge were doing when they took the observation that the wartime bombs were falling on all of us and in a way generalize that to point to the way in which other risks that were very familiar, that there are other ways in which a lot of what happens in our lives is down to good and bad luck. And having a system that pools those risks um, is one that one would have thought that many people would choose if they realize that that's what the system is doing. That maybe it's better to have systems where we all put in a bit to protect ourselves from those risks. That's exactly what the health service does. That's exactly what state education does. Um, that's, that's what a pension system which pays out regardless of how long you live does, and where your pension, where its value keeps up with the, with the incomes of the rest of society. If we can shift back to seeing you know, one person might need the health care, another person might live for a long time and therefore need the insurance against living a long time, and we'd see all of those things together as part of a unified system rather than as each individual bit where we're asking the question, well, what did I get out of that little bit? I'm not in favour of it because I don't benefit today from that part of it, rather than seeing the whole thing. But that requires quite a lot of explanation. It requires quite a lot of... of of realization that the system is a long way away from the tabloid myth that there's a group of people who are unchanging, who are actually costing the rest of us a very large amount of money. The truth is that it's all of us who are responsible for the bulk of the costs, and therefore the implication is all of us should be paying into that to protect not just ourselves, but also our children and our grandchildren. This episode of LSEIQ is dedicated to John, who passed away at the end of last year. As Professor of Social Policy at LSE, he conducted groundbreaking research into the welfare state, inequality, and the role social policies have over a lifetime. His 2014 book, Good Times, Bad Times, The Welfare Myth of Them and Us, debunked misconceptions about the welfare state and showcased John's ability to communicate important research with clarity and compassion. And John didn't simply just critique social policy, he helped change it. Among other things, he advised the government on pension reform, fuel poverty, council housing, as well as income and wealth distribution. This episode of LSEIQ was produced by Sophie Mallet and James Ratti. Join us next time when we ask why are social scientists essential in the design of algorithms?